everyone. Um, I don't speak Italian, but I want to start by saying one thing. Bari e una città bella. Italia bella. Africa is home to 15% of the world's population. It's the cradle of humankind. Africa is home to some of the world's most beautiful natural phenomena. It houses the world's largest known polar desert. Africa is also the home of the largest FGM practicing countries. Female genital mutilation or FGM is the partial or total removal of the female genital exterior. There are four types of FGM. Type one is the partial or total removal of the clitoris. Type two is the removal of the clitoris as well as the inner labia with or without the removal of the labia majora. Type three is the narrowing of the vagina by creating a seal or sewing it together, which is also known as infibulation. Type four is any other harmful practice to the vagina, such as piercing, burning, or cutting, that's done for non-medical reasons. FGM happens in 28 countries in Africa. Out of those 28 countries, eight of them are located within the 12 countries that compromise of the Sahara Desert. I went through FGM myself when I was one week old. And I think I experienced the effects of FGM the most as a 15 year old when I got married. And a lot of times I think I lived all my life believing that FGM was a religious obligation and that it was the only thing to do in order for me to be eligible for marriage. But I think it's important for people to understand that FGM has nothing to do with religion. It predates Islam and all other Abrahamic religions. FGM has no benefit to women and leave girls with lasting physical and mental health implications. When I first decided to talk about this issue and share my story publicly, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done and it's still the hardest thing I will continue to do. And the reason is I come from a culture where people thrive on women's silence. A lot of times a woman is not supposed to talk about things between her legs. A woman is not supposed to talk about her suffering because this is something we've seen our parents go through. My sisters before me went through it. My grandmothers before me went through it. So it's expected that we live through it. And I was startled by the amount of silence in our community. I was startled by the fact that no one was talking about this issue. And to me, it became personal when I had my daughter. I remember holding my daughter close and thinking how I would never allow her to go through what I went through. And the only way I knew how to do that was by speaking out. So I decided to come out with my story and talk to the world about it. And I knew that ending FGM, we had to put a face to it. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a Western country. And by getting people in America to understand that this is the issue that affects them, because a lot of time, I think when we talk about the issue of FGM, we want to make it seem like it's an African problem. It's by those barbaric Africans in somewhere that don't know what they are doing. But FGM is not just an African problem. It's practiced in Asia. It's practiced in the Middle East. And it's something that used to be practiced in countries like the United States. They called it clitoridectomy simply, and it even graced the cover of Playboy. And a lot of times, I think also, we assume that girls who have experienced FGM can say no to FGM, but that's not true, and I think it's naive to believe that. If girls had a choice to practice FGM, I wouldn't stand in front of you. This is a practice that's forced on girls without their say in it, and it's their body. And we have to remember when we allow girls to go through FGM, we are taking their rights to their body, we are taking their rights to feel sexual pleasure. And not only that, I think at the end of the day, we have to understand that 
FGM only exists to control women. And I think it's the lack of understanding and understatement of violence against girls in the first place. And the reason why I do the work that I do, and I continue doing this work, is because I want people to understand that FGM does not define them. I want girls to know that just going through this practice doesn't mean that your life is over. I want women to understand that just because you got married at the age of 15 doesn't mean that life stops there. You can rise up and you can be more than that. I mean, they say that you know, your destiny is defined, but I feel like you can truly change your destiny. I want to also share a video with all of you. By doing this work, I've met a lot of girls like me. It's hard and challenging when you start talking about FGM or when you start working on a similar type of issue. And because of that, we created a sisterhood. It's called the Big Sister Movement. And it's by women all over Africa working on this issue. And I figured that it's a good way for us to support each other, to talk about our best practices. When I went back to my home country of the Gambia and started working on the issue of FGM, half of the things that we were able to do as young people, I didn't think it was possible to get those things done. Young people came together for the first time from various organizations and campaigned like never before. We used the media. We were able to convince the government of the Gambia to ban FGM. And I think it shows the power of commitment. It shows the power of dedication. It shows that nothing is impossible. FGM has been around for God knows, nobody knows how long this practice has been around. And Gambia is a country where 76% of women have experienced FGM. Globally, you have 200 million women who are currently living with FGM. Every year, 2 million girls undergo FGM. And I personally believe that the people that have dedicated their life to ending FGM are people that are worth commending. And with my success in this work, I realize that it's not just my success. And if I want to give up, it's not just Jaha giving up. I'm giving up on 200 million women. If I stop doing what I'm doing, and that's why I think it's very, very important to support the women that I work with. And I just want you guys to watch this short video, and then I'll continue. I saw my cousin being mutilated. When all my cousin's genitals were out, that's when I realized something was terribly wrong. Women are told that you have to be patient and you have to sacrifice. We have a culture of silence. It's just something that women never talk about. I was circumcised twice. I want to let it go, but I cannot accept it to see a young girl going through this. I know the only way we'll stop FGM, no matter where it occurs, is to break down that silence. So it's like you don't have a choice. Is it that you're caught or you're seen like an outcast in the community? So what are you going to do? I said I want to stop it. From what I'm seeing, I'm looking at about 94, 95 percent. Of circumcised? Of circumcised people. people. And we still have a lot of work to do so that the statistics can drop because what we have is still very high. It's still high. An art competition, the first of its kind, to design a poster warning of the dangers of female genital mutilation. This voice, the voice of the voiceless, has to be heard. I'm going to make sure the fire keeps on burning all along. It's not just a saying we are going to end the FGM. A Somali refugee is due to return to advise the government on ending female genital carrying or mutilation. The Gambian government has introduced a ban on female genital mutilation. That, this the ban alone is not enough. It's going to take activists to use media and other platforms to make sure that the message reaches the people that it needs to reach, to make sure the communities are sensitized. What are we waiting for when the community is ready for change? You just have to stand up for your own rights. So what do you want to do? I must fight, I must struggle, I must. I will not just stand like that. Think about the three million girls that are going through this practice every single year, the 6,000 girls a day, just the thought of that. They're only waiting for us to take the message to them and tell them what you're feeling is right. FGM is wrong, that's all. I'm doing one hell of a job. And if you empower these girls, they are going to do the same thing. This video shows that when you empower girls, when you empower people from the community to end FGM, it's something that's impossible. 
And I've traveled a lot throughout the world to talk about FGM, and I've met these amazing women, and because of them, we've started something that's very, very special. And I believe that with our movement, with women standing together, it doesn't matter if you've gone through FGM or not. It doesn't matter if you're from that community or not. One thing that I've always said is that as human beings, we have an obligation to end FGM. And I don't think we can end FGM by judging cultures that practice FGM. That's not how you end FGM. Ending FGM, it's through education and it's through a better understanding of why FGM happens in the first place. By us looking at people that practice FGM and considering them as people that are in Africa and barbaric is not the solution. I think the real solution is empowering girls themselves to speak out against FGM, to break that culture of silence, to stand up. And that's why we started Safe Hands for Girls in the Gambia. We work with young people, we work with religious leaders, we work with survivors, we work with advocates. And now with the launch of our new big sister movement, we will be working in five countries in Africa for a start. We will be in the Gambia, we are working in Somalia, in Sierra Leone, in Nigeria, and in Kenya. And it's very, very important to me that, you know, it's very, very important to me that people realize that this is not something, and I know that I've emphasized that a lot, that ending FGM is not something that's impossible. When I first went to Gambia and started campaigning, I remember people told me that my life would be at risk. People said that because of the type of government that we have in the Gambia, a lot of people were worried about me. But being born in the Gambia, in a village that's with 10,000 people, that's how big my village is. And moving to the United States when I was 15 years old for an arranged marriage. And then going back to my home country at the age of 25 to lobby for a law that no one thought was possible. And getting that law passed and coming back to the United States and being named as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people, to me, that's hope. To me, that's change. And it shows that with determination, it shows that with the right support system, nothing is impossible. When I look, up, when I look at this work that I'm doing, I can't help but think about the Sahara Desert because that's the theme of why we're here today. When you look at the desert, with the harsh ecosystem, the lack of rainfall, and the extreme heat. And this work that we are doing is harsh. I always tell my team, when people come to work with me, one thing that I always tell them is, the roads are very muddy, and they are very dirty. And it's not even a paved way, it's not even a smooth road. That's how hard it has been doing this work. And with, like the desert, my family looks at me that this is not the best career path to grow. And because of all the issues with the desert, it may not seem as the most optimal place to grow. But like we've seen with previous presentations, with anything is possible. The same way they were able to bring water into Petra is the same thing that we are doing with FGM. And I know that my daughter's not going to go through FGM. And because of the law in the Gambia, it's not only my daughter but over a million girls will be saved as a result of the work that we've done collectively in the Gambia. And the sisters in Kenya that are working on this issue, the sisters in Nigeria that are working on this, and our sisters in Sierra Leone that are working on this, with every single one of them, every single day, and I know the sacrifices that they've made. I've made a lot of sacrifices. One of the young girls that work with me told me that we should do a session for what we've lost in this campaign. I've lost friends. I've lost family, but at the end of the day, it's worth it. Because right now, I can stand in front of you and say that because of the work that I'm doing, lives are being saved. Because of the work that I'm doing, every single day, young people are reaching out to me, telling me they want to do exactly what I'm doing, through Twitter, through Facebook. And it shows that change is happening. And don't underestimate you sitting in this room what you can do. You can support people on the ground directly that are working on this issue. You can reach out and educate yourself about this issue. But I think the worst thing that we can do is to judge communities that practice FGM. That, to me, is the worst. We need to bring them together and educate them about the dangers of FGM. And it's only those communities that themselves that can decide that FGM is harmful and end it on their own.
So I want to say thank you for listening to my talk. And Italia, bella again.